Ashima, are you there? Hi. Hi, ma'am. How? Uh, what was your response to the? I know you must have read it carefully. Hi. Yeah. So I was, uh, you know, just going through his interviews, and I'm like, he's com- uh, he's repeatedly talking about corporatized, corporatized media. and i just want to ask him and he also comments on you know vinith jain's uh, comment that we are in uh, advertising business we're not in news business which he says is very intelligent because how do you support revenue models i just want to ask him Meanwhile, what sainath is the revenue joined, so sainath will be able to listen to your question ashish <laughs> sainath is here yeah hi 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 okay now sainath okay can you so, guys see me hear me yeah yeah we can all hear you Yeah. Huh? Hi, Sana. Thank you for doing this. We'll all just get off once uh, once we uh, have introduced you. I'm going to say a few words. Kishla is going to sort of speak a bit, and then it's just over to you. And yeah. many of the students are many. Uh, welcome, students, to uh, to this class where uh, you're very very lucky to have Sana, who I consider one of the finest journalists of our time. I have known him for a long time. When Sana, I have known him for a long time. When, but I ha- actually have an unprinted copy of Everybody Loves a Good Trout. And uh, in an age when journalists go around, before it came out, before it came out as a manuscript, Sana, and when it came out yeah. as a as a book, you signed on it. Uh, Sabha journalism is for readers, not shareholders. So you've stuck to your. <laughs> to your ground ever since uh, anyway and uh, it's, it's uh, and the students are also terribly excited so sainath has won any number of awards i'm not going to do the conventional kind of bio data he is absolutely phenomenal because in an age where everybody is just doing a story and then posing with the story and then tweeting about that i've done the story and so much of people's energies go in that i think sainath has just done the work and he show you know so i'm going to ask ishloy to speak a few words and then over to you uh, sainath thank you so much for joining us my pleasure hi sainath uh, hi, good morning uh, you know since the formal introduction let me formally introduce you out here everybody i think knows you have read you uh, which makes me very happy but still uh, uh for for the for, for the students really you know sainath uh, who is a veteran journalist i prefer the word journalist i don't know some people prefer saying senior journalist veteran journalist but a journalist is a journalist uh he is a journalist on rural affairs poverty and inequality in india uh and sainath has always preferred calling himself a rural reporter uh so he has he is the you know the 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 archetypal reporter uh he has uh, he, he was the former rural affairs editor of the newspaper hindu he has won over 40 global and national awards for his reporting including the raman maxis award asia's most prestigious prize for journalism literature and creative communication arts as well as the amnesty international's global human rights and journalism prize in its inaugural year in 2000 uh sainath's book which many of you here have read everybody loves a good drought Uh, published in 96 by penguin involved covering 100000 kilometers across india remains a non fiction best seller and was declared a penguin classic and as i mentioned sometime back as when we started the class the nobel prize winner amartya sen has called him one of the world's great experts on famine and hunger uh sainath of course is uh, in 2012 2013 that was the time that many of us quit uh regular television sign up or, or journalism sign up also started uh thinking about and launched the people's archive of rural india sari a very ambitious project uh we had a conversation that time of how to raise fund for these kind of digital projects and there was no fund coming really he moved on moved ahead without fund i uh tried doing something that i backed off because i don't have the either the rigor or the uh you know the commitment that sainath has uh he continued and pari contains thousands of pieces of audio video and text stories about life work and identity of the 850 million people of rural india and representing 95 different regions 700 languages of 86 scripts 
Sainath's attention to detail, whether in his reportage or while documenting such a thing, is just phenomenal. And uh, I must uh, remind my students, the journalism students, and also tell Sabha and Sainath that in the first and second semester, uh, a lot of the journalism um, lectures that I have uh, given to the students out here were from Sainath's uh, talks. Uh, one that I particularly remember uh, where he where I, where he, he and I were speaking and he delivered a lecture on uh, many securities. I don't know whether Sainab remembers that at IDSA in 2011. Well. Uh, I have the transcript of that and I, and I reproduce that to the students from time to time. Uh, so, uh, you know, students, your next assignment is on PARI, but apart from the assignment, please uh, follow PARI, spread the word and uh, make sure that, you know, people... Because people will, you know, free news is not a sustainable means. And I think uh, sign up at some point will mention that, that we need to develop a revenue model to be able to, um, you know, good, do good journalism. How can that be done? And you are going to be on the front lines of that. So um, we are at 11.28, as promised, 11.30. So over to you, sign up. And thank you again for being here. Thank you very much. Quite a pleasure. Um, let me begin by attempting to reflect on the question that I overheard um, a little while ago about Vinit Jain's interview in uh, the New Yorker of October 2008, where he said we are in the advertising business, not the uh, news business. I was also part of that story because Ken Auletta was also interviewing me and you'll find that the story I did exposing the Times of India feature on uh, Vidarbha was actually an ad paid for by various co by a corporation, a seed, a seed manufacturing or a seed selling corporation. Um, the thing is that he was sort of giving the game away. He was saying whatever journalists believe in, whatever editors go on and pompously and piously speak about, you know, the ethics of journalism. He was absolutely honest. He said, we are in it for the money. We are in it for the advertising. We are the advertising industry, not the news industry. One of the general managers of Bennett Coleman and co tried to pitch in also in a separate interview with our letter in the same story, you know, saying uh, various uh, that he in fact, the general manager or whatever his designation was said it even more flatly because he had got the go ahead from his boss. He said you can describe us perhaps as a large Equit, uh, you can describe us as an equity company, as an equity firm with a large media holding. Okay. What were they telling you? They were saying, guys, we are in this for the money. Journalism is a very secondary thing. That was the honest admission of the owners. They were not the first to give you that honest admission. About four decades ago, the then owner of the Times, London, um, Lord Kenneth Tom Ken Thompson, Lord Thompson interviewed about he was then buying all the county newspapers, all the minor newspapers around. And when he was asked, why are you buying so many newspapers? Because it was becoming an issue in the monopolies commission and everything else. He said, I buy more newspapers to make more money, to buy more newspapers to make more money. And that's what publishers and owners of corporatized media are about. They're there for the money. The journalism is the tool through which they raise you are their revenue model. But you are secondary to advertising, right? So uh, when there's a clash between your journalism and advertising, that goes out of the, your journalism goes out of the window. In 2002, a company or a, 
entity called Media Net was established, um, which literally sold editorial space. Then you had a private treaties. Sounds like an agreement between India and China on the Brahmaputra waters or something. It isn't. A private treaty is a deal between a middling middle league corporation trying to break into the big league and finding that it doesn't have the marketing power and a giant newspaper at that time, probably the largest circulated English newspaper in the world. Um, a deal between them in which say I am the newspaper and you guys are the middling little company. You need me. We strike a deal, a private treaty in which I immediately acquire 7%, maybe even 10% of your shares. In, in return, we strike your advertising quota for the year. Right now you will we will pay for those shares. Again, we will adjust the cost of those shares against the advertising that you put in my paper. Guess what? The moment you do that, I become a part owner of the company. I have a vested interest in the company. I'm going to be giving my list, my reporters, a list of companies they cannot badmouth or investigate or embarrass. Now, when you have treaties with 200 companies, imagine what happens to the freedom of the reporter to investigate. Anyway, we can get to that later today. We, I agreed to speak on uh, rural journalism or a critical look at rural reporting. Let's, you know, something very interesting happened on March 26th in the media. Mm -hmm. What the, what was uh, interesting that happened on the media on 26th, suddenly the media discovered this species called the migrant laborer. In two weeks from then, in two weeks from then, we got more news more photographs, more discussions on migrant laborers than probably we had in the preceding two decades. Go back before the lockdown and look at the previous year. You, can, you guys can do this as an exercise in your journalism school. Some of you can take newspapers. Some of you can take broadcasting. Look at the channels. Find me one full length panel discussion or whatever discussion on migrant laborers in this country. The 2011 census showed us that migrations between 2001 and 2011 were the greatest we had ever seen in our history, including the partition migrations. Even those were not so vast as what happened between 2001 census and 2011 census. So given that the census was saying that there is an extraordinary movement of human beings, you think we'd have had a discussion on that? No, go back, search, search for any half hour discussion or 29 minute discussion on TV which is about what the heck is happening in the countryside? What are so many people moving about for? You have more than 400 million migrants in your country. About 100, more than 100 million have crossed state borders. OK, now no such discussion. Go back and look for articles on. You will find some. You will find them in the Hindu. I wrote them saying that we have seen the biggest um, shift in demography since the 1921 census. Now let me, you know, there's no harm in you guys learning a little bit of history. In, in the 2011 census was unique in our history because for the first time in independent India 
And only the second time after 1921, urban India added more to people to its population than rural India did. That had never happened in history except in 1921. What happened in 1921? Now you have been reading in the last two, three weeks about the great pandemic of 1918, the so-called misnamed Spanish flu, right? The Spanish flu took between 16 and 20 million lives in this country. It was not a Spanish flu. It was taken back by soldiers, all those countries participating in World War I, fighting in the so-called green fields of France. And, the, and God knows what kinds of weapons were used there. Certainly chemical weapons of a kind were used. Mustard gas was freely used. And people came back with ailments to their countries. And those countries from where soldiers from France and Europe returned to, they had the flu. 16 to 20 million human beings died in your country of that flu. The estimates started at 11 million. Then the census said maybe it's 13 million, but a lot of people were obviously not counted. Uh, but the historians and demographers look at a figure between 16 and 20 million lives. Because of that, the first and only time Rural India recorded a net reduction in population. Do you hear that? Rural India registered a net deficit, a net, a net reduction, sorry, in uh, population. So many people had died. Now, we know that in 2001 to 2011, there was no such great pandemic. There was a lot of panic. But over SARS in 2001, 2002, but there was no such mass pandemic of deaths in India between two. And yet, urban India recorded an addition of 91 million human beings between 2001 in the preceding decade. Rural India recorded an addition of 19 million human beings. That means urban India added 1 million human beings more than rural India did. And why? what is the comparison point we can take? You can take the 2001 census, the census just preceding this one. In the 2001 census, urban India added um, 68 million human beings between 91 and 2001. Urban India added 68 million human beings. Rural India added 113 million human beings. In short, rural India added 45 million human beings more than urban India did. Within 10 years, you have a switch around, not of 1 million, but of 46 million and urban India ends up for the first time since 1921, the first time ever after independence, adding more people than rural India. Now, if there was no pandemic, no mass deaths, what led to that urban India adding those numbers? Migrations is probably the biggest explanation you have for that. The census gives us three reasons why these changes occur. One, they say change in family size or growth, growth rate of the population. But actually, population growth rates in India, especially urban, have been falling and falling very rapidly. So it was not the growth of family size or population growth rate that led to urban India having more. Second, Urban India's family size and family growth rate is much lower than that of rural India, yet it added more human beings. That leaves you. That leaves you with. Oh, also, there's another reason. Town, uh, villages getting reclassified as they do in every census. 
some villages, many villages get reclassified as towns. But if you look at the number of statutory towns reclassified, I mean villages reclassified as towns in the 2011 census, it just does not show you that kind of population figure. So it was not just a matter of reclassification. There was actual movement of people. And the explanation for that is migrations. However, I also want you to know because we are we are listening to. We are listening to people who would recognize a migrant if he kicked them in the face. OK, lecturing us on migrants. Who is a migrant? What kinds of migrants are there? If you want to know about rural reporting, you need to know this. You need you need to know your country. You need to know your society. You need to know what the hell is happening around you. Look at the way. Urban India is taken entirely by surprise when we are told that millions of people are walking off towards their homes. How many myths there are in the uh, assumptions that allowed us to be comfortable without knowing that. If migrants were so many in number, if migrants are so important, how come we never discussed them once in the last 20 years? How come all coverage of migrants happens when it affects our comfort, when our servants, domestic helpers, domestic workers, when they up and leave, oh, then we are worried about migrants. I think you all need to also, I need to as well, do some introspection about the selfishness with which we cover the migrants. Hmm? We didn't cover them when many other things were happening. We didn't cover them when huge migrations were taking place from rural to urban. We didn't cover them then. When our gardeners, our sanitation workers, our domestic helpers, our construction laborers, our canteen workers, when our security personnel, the chaukidars, when suddenly all of them up and leave and it renders all our lives incredibly uncomfortable because we've been used to having people work at such low salaries, at such under such pathetic conditions with no security whatsoever. Hmm? No health benefits, nothing. Suddenly, I'm not denying that there's a lot of compassion I'm not denying that there's a lot of sympathy. Yeah, but we didn't even know about them earlier to exercise compassion or sympathy. One more little thing I'd like to tell you. It isn't your compassion that matters. You know, don't fight for compassion. It's an issue of justice. Yeah, you want to cover the migrants. You want to cover rural India. The frame you adopt is not compassion. The lens you need to look at is issues of rights, justice and entitlements. And I would say that today justice is the foremost of those issues. If you're trying to talk about rural India. Another thing. Migrants, a lot of people simply understand migration as somebody leaving a village in Bihar and coming to the great metropolis of Mumbai where I live. Uh, that isn't the only kind of migration, nor necessarily the only major kind of migration. There are multiple kinds of migrations taking place all around the country. You need to know that you need to be informed. You need to know something about this place and you need to know something about your society to understand what's happening. And then you figure out why it's happening. There are migrants very large numbers of migrants, millions of them, who are what we call rural to rural migrants. They're not necessarily going to the top metros. In fact, the top metros have shown a slowdown in the last 20 years of the number of people they're able to absorb. So rural to rural migrations. I leave my village and go to a village in some other district or maybe even across the state border where I hear that something's happening. Maybe there's a highway coming. I'm going to get work in that as a road layer, a tar layer, 
mixer, whatever it is. So I proceed there. That's rural to rural migration, and that's plenty of it. Millions. Then there is rural to small town, small urban areas. Again, this is quite huge. Third, there is um, rural to urban metros also. That also happens, and that has been huge in the last 30, 40 years, the last 30 years particularly, okay, to your urban metros and elsewhere. Four, there is a lot of, there is urban to urban migration as well. I'm one. I, my, my father came to Chennai from Kakinara in Andhra when it was not a big town. It didn't have a railhead, nothing. So it was almost just a little, a big village. And uh, he came to Chennai. I was born and brought up in Chennai. Graduated from there, went to Delhi. Graduated from Jawaharlal Nehru University, worked in the United News of India, migrated to Mumbai. The reason I'm telling you this is, never look at migrations with a unilinear or a uniform lens. Class segregation, class factors are very, very important in migrations. I was an urban middle class migrant. I Wherever I went, I had networks. I had my social capital, the education that I had, I had each each change I made improved my life, improved my material life at any rate. The migrant at the level you're watching now on your TV, each move he or she makes does not necessarily make their lives better. Often it makes it worse because that they don't have those networks, those caste and class networks, the fallback on our caste and class networks, nor the social capital we achieve in networking our way around the country. That's one thing. But the fifth class of migrant, that is the weakest, the poorest, the most troubled migrant. It's what we call, there are, there are groups of migrants within these, okay? All of you are familiar with seasonal migrants, peasants from Bihar or Jharkhand who go to Punjab for the harvest and after the after Baisakhi around then they return. Some of them don't return, they stay there as permanent migrants. So that's one, the seasonal migration. Then there are the long term migrants. You know, those who move to another place and settle there. Then there are the chain and relay migrants. The first migrant from Ramnad, Ramnadapuram in Tamil Nadu settles 60, 70 years ago in what we today call Dharavi, around that area. Today there is a basti of his community in that in that in Dharavi. Okay. More, you know, you write home and or you tell ring home and say, come on in, the water's fine. And then your relatives and your family and others join you. That's another kind of migration. There are the, but the weakest kind of migration. The, there are the circular and short term migrations. But the weakest migrant is what I call the footloose migrant. These are the poorest people. They are, they move from place to place without any clear destination. Okay. Or multiple destinations. Poor people in Kalahandi, in Bulangir, in Koraput, in Odisha. When a tourist season comes up, they go to Raipur in Chhattisgarh. There, they pull rickshaws, do various things. That season lasts for a bit. Then it stops. Then some of them go to Vizianagaram in Andhra Pradesh, the same group, some of them, and there they make bricks in the brick kilns. Brick kilns are amongst the most exploitative, nastiest places that you can be a worker in on earth. Okay, 
You're a bonded laborer for all practical purposes. Well, anyway, the brick making season is over. They might shift to Mumbai to work on construction sites for a bit. There are many Odia workers who have been in five, six states in the course of a year. They don't get counted also in the census or in the other surveys because they are on the move. That we know very little about these footloose migrants. As a journalist covering rural India for 30 years, I've made it my business to focus on footloose migrations. You know how you cover a migration? Yeah, you become a migrant. You walk with them. You move with them. You live with them. You learn about them. One of the rules, guys, is that you have to try doing what it is you're trying to understand. OK. Uh, or at least you've got to observe up front what is what is happening. You know, if you don't make these class distinctions, there's no there's no difference then between a migrant from Bulangir shifting to Mumbai and the chief executive of Infosys taking up a job with Google and moving from Mumbai to Delhi. What's the difference? They're both migrants. That's why I'm saying you need to have a lens that factors in caste, class, social backgrounds. You need to make that disaggregation in the different kinds of migrants there are. Then you need to understand if you can get into the skin of that migrant or at least observe up close. Here's the wonderful thing, and here is the reason why your media are struggling and going to struggle even worse in understanding what the hell is going on. Uh, you know, if you cover a football match as a sports correspondent or a cricket match, I'd assume, I'd assume that you would go and watch the match. Of course, there are some wonderful people who watch it on television and report from there, which is fine. OK, great, but it isn't the same thing, right? So I would also want that if you are going to write about migrants, you're going to write about poor people, you'd have to be present where they are, not just in the case of an event or an emergency, but on a regular basis. It's got to be your beat. Like if you're if you're covering parliament, you're a reporter for parliament. Covering parliament, you would attend parliament many days during the session. When the session is closed, that's another matter, but you would go there. Likewise, if you are interested in the lives of everyday people, of ordinary people, you've got to know their life on the remaining 365 days, not just on March 25th not just on March 26th. Now your average Indian newspaper. Hmm? How many of them have a labor correspondent? When I joined journalism, that was a hell of a long time ago, 1980. Every newspaper had a labor correspondent. We considered it important to know what was happening with the working class. We considered it important for ourselves, for society and for the working class that there should be a labor reporter. Find me a full time labor reporter, full time labor reporter on any channel or newspaper in the country today. Agriculture reporter. A heck of a lot of people who call themselves agriculture reporters are actually covering the agriculture ministry or some are just covering the agriculture minister. They don't cover farmer as in the farming operations. Some of them even visit the countryside. They, they condescend to do it once in a while. But when they write, they write quoting the they write quoting Fiki and Asokam and you know the commerce and the business lobbies on what's needed on the reforms that are needed. How much do you get of the voices of farmers themselves, of laborers themselves? Now consider the small statistic. If you do not have a full time correspondent. For labor, migrant labor. Industrial labor, 
if you do not all kinds of labor, farm labor, and you do not have a single full time correspondent on labor as a newspaper, if you do not have a single correspondent full time on farming as from the ground, what are you saying? You're saying that 75% of the population don't make news and you are not interested in them. That's what you're saying. You're saying 75% of the population don't count. They don't matter. Although if they did, you'd have a correspondent covering them, right? Now, none of these newspapers or channels. There are wonderful journalists exceptions within all these newspapers and not all within several of these newspapers and channels. There are wonderful journalists. I know I, I know several of them personally. I'm proud to say some of them were my students. Who would very easily cover this, who are dying to cover these processes and cannot do so because the beat doesn't exist. They're not important enough. In 2006, at the height of the Vidarbha farm suicides, a group of young reporters asked their editors in the Times of India of that time in Mumbai, why is it that we should not be covering these farmers suicides in far greater detail? Why should they got a memo? The memo said. You know, and I will. It was not formally called a memo, but it was a reply to them saying. Dying farmers in Vidarbha. Do not purchase the Times of India or its products. The elites of Sobo do. I'm summing it up for you. That was roughly what the content was. Why the hell should I cover you if you do not give me revenue? That's the position. And that brings us back to the Vinit Jain thing. What has happened under corporatization is that journalism has become, has been reduced to a revenue stream. I do not think journalism is a revenue stream. Now, Mr. Samir Jain, before Mr. Vinit Jain, said and has told me in a, in a meeting, it's a, it's a business like any other business. And that's how you've got to think. I understand where he's coming from. But there's a distinction. Newspapers are a business, yes. Media are a business, yes. Ta television channels are a business. Portals are a business. Journalism is not a business. Journalism is a calling. You don't go into it with the idea of constructing a gigantic salary and joining the Forbes billionaires .com. All of us would love to be there in Forbes billionaires .com, But it's not the reason we went to journalism for. If that was your motivation, you choose a more sensible profession for that kind of a thing. You come to journalism because you want to connect with your society. You come to journalism because you think there are stories that need to be told. You come to journalism because you are curious about how your fellow human beings live. You want to know about that. You want to tell their stories. You want to earn, learn their stories. Journalism is a calling, not a business. Unfortunately, the distinction between journalism and media has been obliterated. Newspapers have very little to do with journalism. There are newspapers like that, right? So that's one set of issues. You now know who are the migrants. OK, there are seasonal migrants. There are long term migrants. Now, what happened to these people on 26th who started walking? You know, there was so much sadness over the fact that people were trying to walk hundreds of kilometers. It's heartbreaking. I want you guys to know something. This is unique. This time was unique in that people were trying to walk gigantic distances. OK, and that, you know, they're intercepted at state borders. They put into some camp or they're barricaded out of their own villages. That's a that's a unique situation or a rare situation. You need to know. 
that migrants in this country for decades and decades have walked home 200, 300 kilometers quite regularly. For instance, the migrants of South Rajasthan who work for rich families in Ahmedabad, Vadodara, Surat, Amreli, wherever else, they walk back to Rajasthan when the bosses go on their, you know, uh, European tour, you know, one of those where Jain food is assured or whatever else is assured, one of those tours. We don't even give that laborer the comfort of a railway ticket or a bus ticket back home. They walk home. And you know how they walk home? How do they survive 200, 300 kilometers walk? How do they survive 200 to 300 kilometers walk? They do it over three days, four days. You walk 40 kilometers. You come to a Daba. You walk 50, 40, 50 kilometers. You come to a Daba on the highway. That night, you work at the Daba. You're the guy giving out the meals, giving out the dinner on which all of us, you and I are sitting on the charpoy before getting into our SUVs and proceeding. He then sleeps there that night, sets out early in the morning at 435, walks the next 30, 40, 50 kilometers to a major bus stand where again in the tea stall or whatever, he works as a helper. He works his way back to his home in southern Rajasthan, eating and drinking at those bus stands, dabas, earning his way back because we are too stingy to give him a railway ticket or a bus ticket. He has to do that from the pathetic wages we give him or her. Okay. Now, here's the problem. This time, when they are trying to walk back, those dabas are closed, those bus stands are closed, those highway restaurants are closed, the tea stalls are closed. And so they can die of dehydration, diarrhea. They can die of a, a lot of people. You know, the entire method of counting the people dying in this crisis is not taking into account, is not factoring in the number of people who are dying of non-COVID diseases because our entire focus our entire medical resources are concentrated on COVID. So people who are diabetics who may have had a stroke, people who are cancer patients are lying on the pavements of streets in Mumbai, outside the Tata Memorial Hospital, outside the KEM. They're lying on the pavements, cancer patients who've come from villages in Bihar or UP. So all those options are closed by which you made your way back home. And people are trying to do it and they're getting into very serious trouble. Yeah, so something so, so that's something you want to interrupt me or I will just tell you a, a little elaboration of what Kishaloy had mentioned. What the heck is rural India anyway? Hmm? Ask your average editor. How is rural India? defined officially. What is the definition of rural India in the census of India and see if they know? They're unlikely to know because, my dears, there is no definition of the rural in the Indian census. OK, there is a definition of the urban or the urban town. An urban town or an urban an urban area is anything where with a pop where the population is 5000 or above where the density per square kilometer is 400 4000 or above um, and uh, uh, 400 or above and where the male worker population 20, less than 25% of the male workers population is in agriculture, which means that in that village, agriculture has collapsed in that area. If less than 25% of males are in agriculture, it means agriculture has ceased to function in any significant way as an employer there. 
Now, this is urban. Whatever doesn't fit this definition is rural. As simple as that. And as unbelievably bloody complex as that. You can imagine how many different things are clubbed into this bag or sack called rural. Now, rural India, and I'm very biased, is to me the most magical place for a reporter on earth. And I have I have done journalism, some journalism in other countries as well. Um, for me, it is absolutely magical. You know, every every year till two years ago, my friends in Odisha and I, fellow journalists, Purushottam, Thakur, Jagdish, Suna, we travel from a place in western Odisha called Kalahandi to a place in southwestern Odisha, south southern Odisha, where Koraput and Bulangir, uh, where Koraput, Raigada, Naurangpur are. It's just 280 kilometers. We take a week to do it because on that 280 kilometers, we are getting down every half hour, one hour, because there are 40 languages, unique languages spoken on that route. That's how complex. That's how incredibly complex your country is. 40 languages are spoken on those 280 kilometers. Some of them, no relation to each other at all from different from different families of languages. A few of them, a couple of them, we don't know from what family of languages they come. That's how complex and diverse your society is. When we also stop on the route, at the heart, you know the heart, the village market. It's something so beautiful in the sense that I'm looking at in the heart. People from different villages come to sell their stuff. The heart gives you a one moment glance at the entire rural economy of that region. Everything that's produced there will be at the heart. But the most beautiful thing is that there are people haggling, fighting, quarreling, selling, pitching, rejecting. In 16 languages, I don't know your language, you don't know mine. But we transact. You don't know my culture, I don't know yours. I know that you're a Gadaba, I know that I'm a Bonda. OK, I don't know your language. Maybe you don't mind, maybe you don't. But we get across and we make ourselves understood conclude that transaction and get off, get home, you know, end up maybe getting slightly drunk and go home and next day to the next market. When I came to Mumbai in 1981, that's what I loved about this city. I spent a lot of time on the trains counting how many languages were spoken. How many language I have counted 21 languages in one train on the suburban railway of Mumbai. For me, that's India, the microcosm of people getting together, being together, living in tolerance, not as we have today, an attempt to impose one language on 1.3 billion people. Rural India is magical. It is also very miserable. There are many beautiful things about rural India. Occupational diversity, the largest number of Weavers in the world, 95% of handloom comes from this country. Uh, the largest number of potters in the world, you name it. And how many different schools of weaving and potting, uh, pot, pottery, we will never know. There is also an extremely ugly side to rural India. Caste, gender oppression, untouchability. These are also all present in urban India as well if you care to look, but in rural India, they stand naked. They are institutionalized and accepted on a larger scale than in urban India. So you have both kinds of, you have the beautiful and the barbaric, the exotic and the absolutely appalling, right? That's rural India. In fact, maybe it's India as well. So the thing is, when you're trying to report, 
five, six principles. One is don't try telling the stories through experts, please. Listen to experts, talk to experts, but tell the stories through the lives of people. It's through the lives of readers read you if your story is compelling and you're telling them stories. You know, not quoting something tank in Delhi on migrations, but talking, letting the voice of the migrant himself or herself speak to you, tell you their story. Yeah, that's one rule. Second, when you are with toddy tappers or migrants or boatmen or fishermen or weavers or potters or honey collectors, when you're conversing with them, please, uh, the second rule, shut up and listen. Okay, Ask questions. Journalism is the art of the question. You're not there to find solutions to the secrets of life. I mean, you know, I'll be very glad if you do, but that's not what okay. your purpose is. You need to pose the question. Your job as a reporter is not. You know, you're not in the advertising business. You're there to signal the weaknesses in your society. Good journalism, a good newspaper, a good channel. Is a nation in conversation with itself, a society in argument with itself. Yeah, now you just look at the panel discussions that we have. Look at the budget discussions that we have. The evening before our lead star anchor will sit with all the, you know, Tata, Birla, Zambani's, everybody else. There's a, there's a whatever party, a cocktail or whatever over there and everybody gives their views. When have you ever invited a worker or a farmer to those meetings? They don't matter, right? Before that budget, the finance minister meets CII, Confederation of Indian Industry. He meets FIKI, he meets ASOCAM, he meets various lobbies of trade and industry. Does he sit down with the trade unions, with the Kisan Sabhas, with the farmers? No. Your job as a reporter is not to repeat that crap. What 1% of the population think, what 1% of the population want, and inevitably what 1% of the population get. Your job is to try understanding how the others live. In the People's Archive of Rural India, which I hope you will see, and you will see what I mean by letting people speak, by letting their voices come through, our motto is the everyday lives of everyday people. Now you can do that in a very boring way, and that will happen in a very boring way. If you go and write essays and how you felt, listen, I send you there to write a thousand word piece. You've got a thousand words. Don't fill it with your emotions, please. I want to, I want to know about theirs. You know, this narcissism in a lot of journalists, this narcissism in a lot of authors, writers and media people. We go out somewhere and. You know, shed tears all over our copy on what's happening to these poor people. And are happy to paint them in their victim framework rather than let them tell you what their story is. Let them tell us what they think is happening. Let them tell us what they think needs to happen, not CII on the eve of the budget, but what these people think needs to happen. They are the majority of your population. They are the majority of what we call the Indian people, right? So shut up and listen. Learn the stories of people. Third, there is a basic discipline to reporting, whether rural or urban. Our class inhibitions, our class hangups and our caste hangups make it very difficult for us to rise above a particular pull of society and a pull of value systems going back centuries, if not millennia. And we don't know how to conduct ourselves. With ordinary people. 
that I mean, I don't want to get into details about dealing with people from the bottom of the, say Dalits and Adivasis. There are a number of ways in which we signal our inhibitions and people catch those signals. So the question is spend time on your story. Be with people because the first thing you've got to establish, the first thing is your credibility with people. In, in this country, everyone will be polite to you in the countryside at least. Everyone will be polite to you. They'll be nice to you and they will also ask you what the use, what's the use of talking to you. They will ask you very politely. Lots of journalists come here and say things and write things and nothing ever happens. So which is also partly true. So how do you establish your credibility with them? That's an even more important problem than language. If people want to communicate with you, they will find a way and you will find a way. So go out there, listen to people, live where you with the community that you're covering. If you can spend time with them, go back to a place. Often you develop an expertise over that area in that domain. These are some of the most basic things. The others are technical things in the writing and stuff which we can get into if you want to. But I think I should allow you to now shoot your questions. And we can take it further in the discussion. Is that OK? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, OK. That was fabulous. Tana, can I clap for you? I'm going to clap. I'm really going to clap because, I mean, you know, I don't want to flatter you too much, but it is by far the best journalism lecture I've ever heard. I'm, and you've just said it all that I would, I mean, uh, that I would want the students to hear. And thank you so much for doing it. And now, uh, Kishla, you have a few remarks. And let's open it up to the students. I don't have any remarks. I mean, let's wait, take the question. But I remember, you know, what Saina just now said. And, you know, uh, earlier, just to quote him, uh, oh. he said that, you know, oh. I say that a nation that condemns the majority of its people to everyday indefinite insecurity can never be secure itself. This is uh, the first proposition, he says. You uh, condemn uh, the overwhelming uh, majority uh, of your people to instability, everyday insecurity. You can never be a nation as a nation be oh secure. God. So even from the point of view of you know the the secretization of, of how the the, the so-called majority majoritarian uh, government conceives you know the security of the nation is also lies in the hands of how you secure your 75 percent population which currently they do not even uh, realize or they don't care care about so i mean this is my uh, just to go back to what Sainath himself said in one of his lectures uh, and let's open up to the question questions now right so just very quickly i think uh, students would please uh, some of you already I, do, I don't know how to the chaos so let me start with ashima's question because she already had a question in mind because i think many people will be wanting to go ahead and uh, one is just getting used to the medium so ashima please go ahead hi sir uh, so sir i was addressing the vineet jain question that you answered uh, however i wanted to Ask, you just mentioned uh, that people, you know, want to know that so many journalists come here, but what happens after that? So how do you address that question? Because, you know, not every story will need lead to a national discourse, but it is important to bring it out. You've actually already answered your own question, Ashima, very substantially. Mm. You're, you know, I think journalists must have a very realistic understanding of what we do and what it achieves, can achieve, cannot achieve. The press or journalism generally works sometimes in a very tenuous way. You do the most brilliant story and nothing happens. Or after five years, some administrator comes to that place, picks up on your idea and a story you thought was dead comes alive. Both can happen. Nothing happens or something happens many years later. Second, you do a rather mediocre story and you bring down a government. Okay, 
that also can happen because there are so many other variables and factors at play. You know, we you do you do a very uh, when we did the when when I broke the paid news story on the front page of the Hindu and Ashok Chavan's uh, paid news thing and and we named we named the five big newspapers of this country that were conducting paid news not as journalistic corruption but as an industry. Man, the fallout from that and understand this. Except for the Indian Express and the Hindu, all the other newspapers remained quiet. They all remained quiet because they were all participating in the paid news industry. And yet that thing caught fire, went all the way to the Supreme Court and there are still cases hanging there. Okay, there are still cases hanging there. One of the uh, you know, one of the interesting things that happened in that was a story about Mr. Vilasrao Deshmukh and uh, in the in the la in those several years helping a big money lender in vidarbha for which the nagpur bench fined him 25000 rupees uh, you know he went in protest to the supreme court and it was the time when all our exposures were coming out and the supreme court made the fine from 25000 rupees it converted it into a 10 lakh fine Mind you, the damn government of Maharashtra went and paid his fine, which they should not have paid. It was an individual action of that minister, of the chief minister. So, so it's very difficult to say that a story will absolutely achieve. It's not so simple at all. You're not the only factor in society. There are so many other things going on. A mediocre story can break down a government. A brilliant story can help entrench it. All these things happen. What do you tell people? You tell people with complete honesty. Uh, one of the things, let me tell you what I do. If I'm going into a community, a society where I'm not known at all, which is every other day. Yeah. One of the great things about rural India is the anonymity you have. Because another village, you're a complete next village, you're a complete stranger all over again, which is a good thing in some ways. Um, I if I'm when I you're going to ask people extremely intrusive questions about their family. What the heck you're going to ask some woman? How much alcohol does your husband consume? Yeah, does he beat you? You're you have the what gives you that bloody right to go and ask such intrusive questions? If you ask someone that in the urban area, she would give you. I mean, she would punch you in the face. Right, but we feel free to go and ask people the most intrusive questions in return for that. In exchange for that, you have to clarify to them. That they have equal right to ask you questions. They have an equal right to ask you who the hell are you and what are you doing here and what do you think you're going to do with the material that you collect from us of what use when they say, how is it going to help us? They're also hinting at. How is it going to help you? What's there in it for you? They're asking you that question as well. OK, they're politely asking you the question of what are you getting out of it? I make it very clear to people I have in my career dealt with communities that do not know what a newspaper is like the Bondas in the 90s. Or actually individuals who may not know what a camera is, but that that time has moved forward. However, you have to explain to people that you what your role as a journalist is, who you are, where you're coming from, what you intend to do, and you have to answer that question by saying, look, I'm here because I am interested in your life and in your problem. I really want that something happens, but I simply cannot promise you that something will happen. Who knows if it happens, it happens. We hope it will happen and I would try my, the way I work as a journalist. I try my best to see that something happens. But quite often it doesn't. However, what does happen? Is that fell other fellow Indians or substantial numbers of them get to know about your life, get to know about your problems 
get to understand that we can't solve our problems without addressing your problems. I think if you're very honest with them and tell them this, that, you know, I really can't give you this guarantee that everything will change, but sometimes it does. Right now, Pari and the People's Archive of Rural India, we are, the, I think, the only ones covering the COVID crisis from every corner of the country. Last night, from the pastoral herders of the Kutch, the Fakirani Jats. Okay. Now, we are finding in this crisis, we are bombarded with messages from readers on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, asking us, how can we reach out to these people and help? How can we reach out to these people? How can we help? Now, PARI is not a disbursement agency. We are not an NGO. We are not a service delivery organization. What we are trying to do is, in fact, telling our reporters now to take the bank details of those individuals who are going to come in their story. And uh, it's raised a few lakhs in different quarters across the country. I normally would not do this, but we don't give it to the PM Cares Fund, okay? We don't want to do that. We don't want to raise money for that. If any money is to be raised, where we have a role in it, we want it to go directly to the individuals who are in dire need. Like two 80-year-old women, Pardi women in Pune district, whose occupation professionally is begging. Now they're not allowed into the villages, the Pardis. So what do they do? They're starving. So we have to then go to some social worker who works with them, use her bank account detail because they don't have bank accounts. Okay? Yeah. And then you reach them. So there are various little things you do, but you do not exaggerate your role to yourself or to those you're speaking with. Absolutely. I mean, I, I'm just... That's such an important point because uh, Ashima, to all the students, there's been a lot of giving at this point. And uh, if you just give quietly and you literally get the bank account details and you find many people do not have those accounts. Exactly what sign up. In fact, I'll privately later, there's a conflict involved here also. As journalists, how much do we start raising money for other people? There is a problem there. I think Tita has a question. You know, uh, Tita, go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, I am a third year journalist student. I wanted to ask you uh, about your address at the IAWS uh, speech this year, where you had spoken about how 60% uh, of the farming work in this country is done by women, uh, but they are uh, their suicides are never accounted for because they're not considered as farmers. And uh, when this was brought up as an issue uh, with the NCRB, Maharashtra incentivized the males with a one third discount. And that's when they started putting the women on the uh, record list as farmers and landowners. But they still never got to know about it. Um, so in during coronavirus, uh, the uh, PM is all set to make uh, 2000 rupees uh, donations to these farmers through their Kisan scheme Yojana and they're re-recording the entire list of farmers. But how do we ensure uh, as journalists or can we ensure at all that these women will be included in this whole new list that is being made for say the 7.7 .7 million beneficiaries in Maharashtra when they're not even accounted? Good question. You see, the thing is, I'm sorry to tell you that mostly they will not be accounted. Um, I think that, see your earlier question for the benefit of your classmates and others, what happens is that, see what the status we accord to women in our society, the way we treat them, the rights we give or deny them rather, that's going to reflect in every policy we adopt. That's going to reflect in what we do as a government, as a nation. Now, you're correct. Do you know that when, when I not only said 60% of all work in agriculture is done by women, the ILO, the ILO earlier this year came out with a figure and Oxfam interpreted that data as well. Women and adolescent girls 
perform 12.5 billion b billion with a b 12.5 billion hours of unpaid work every single day of every single year just imagine how many that hours that is in a year 12.5 billion hours in 24 hours the women and adolescent build unpaid work since it's unpaid work we are not going to count it as work because when we talk about work participation rate work women we accept as work that which is paid for women's work is mainly not paid for so you know so we are not going to count them in, in as workforce second we deny women in this country rights to property in land rights to land ownership okay so it may be that they are doing by the way it's not unique to india ecuador you can go to latin i mean you can go to central america south america africa you'll find a lot of places where women every place women do the bulk of work in agriculture but ownership is in male hands in fact we ritualize that in indian agriculture a woman is not allowed to do plowing the start of the season the first touch of the plow plowing tilling certain functions she is excluded from ritually because there the male restates his ownership and control of land so she gets to be the farmer's wife or the farmer's mother or the farmer's daughter or sister yeah and in the long you there is no way you can solve many of these problems without ensuring property equal property rights for women in land if we can't do that the other changes we may make even if they are improvements will be transitory or transitional they will or temporary they'll they'll make a good step step forward and they'll go away uh the third is because they are not counted as farmers they tend to be undercounted they are counted they are terribly undercounted in the farmers suicides because the investigating constable or police officer will come and say patta dikha for the person who has died on the patta her name is not going to be there how many of those women do we ever put the the point you made about what happened in maharashtra it also happened in rajasthan the government gave an incentive in land registration costs one third off per acre if you put the spouse's name also on the patta making it a joint patta now if you own 10 acres that could be a saving of 40000 rupees which is real money in the indian countryside so i go and put my wife's name on the patta and i don't tell her you know in one way it's a step forward because she is now an owner in another way she doesn't know about it because i never told her but legally we have changed the status a bit now how do we ensure there are a new there are numerous ways uh, i'm sorry i didn't get your name these teetha my name is teetha teetha ghosh okay teetha ghosh Tita, the what I think what we should be doing now is to get some of the most important work women do, and it is on which our fight against COVID depends. We need to get that women's work regularized. I'm not just interested in the charity, though. That's very important that we give out life-saving life jackets to everyone and ensure that women get them. but there are by the way more than a million women in your country called ashas accredited social health activist there are anganwadi workers men the future the health the survival of the children of the country rests in the hands of these women who we do not accept as employees do not give them a regular salary or a salary scale we give an uh, one of these anganwadi workers 3000 rupees a month an honorarium and a helper gets 1500 the ashas i mean whether in the ashas or anganwadis some 
Now there's an additional 1,000 given after all of us and all, all their bodies have complained about it. What the heck will you do on 3,000 rupees a month? Okay, I am saying that all these ASHA workers, these social health, uh, social health activists and the Anganwadi workers feeding your children. All of them have got to be regularized as employees of the government of the state. Or of the government of India, they've got to be regularized and paid scales that other government officers or other government officials are in the immediate stuff. I'm saying that no in in distributing food. Please do not just throw out the criteria of ration card, BPL, APL, IPL. Forget all this shit. Yeah, if you do that, a hell of a lot of women, especially old women, are going to be excluded. They don't have ration cards or there are ration cards on which they don't have their name. They don't have anything. They don't have, you know, so they're not going, they're going to be excluded. The, Specific answer to your question is immediately say that the food distribution will be universal and regardless of your having a ration card or anything else. And the same will happen in distribution of the food, where I think that for many communities, it's got to be doorstep delivery in this because we are holding up many communities inside their slum or stall and not allowing them to step out. Okay. And many of these are, uh, you know, we are bringing our specifically new neo Indian nastiness to it by turning this into institutionalized discrimination against minorities. Many of minorities are now holed up in ghettos like that, unable to come out. Where do they get that food that's being distributed unless you actually deliver it? That way, You'll, you'll, you'll ensure that there's a fairer distribution, a fairer deal. No other, no, uh, no biometrics, no ration card. Distribute. There is serious distress. And one of the lessons we should learn from this, how alive poverty is in this country after 25 years of kidding ourselves that it is, you know, poverty is history. We have, we have, Chief economic, you know, uh, three years ago, we had the chief economic advisor of India and the, one of the members of the Niti Ayuho tell Nidhi Razdan on her TV program, inequality is not an issue. It doesn't matter a damn. If I have wealth and I want to flaunt it, that's my business. These famous last words were spoken by Mr. Vivek Debroy. And Mr. Arvind Subramaniam, who's now, you know, on the side of the angels, apparently, or maybe it was a good cop, bad cop routine. I don't know, but they were arguing with Thomas Piketty and both of them said this. Okay, Vivek Debroy, also chief economic advisor then to the chief minister of Rajasthan, Niti Aayog member. Inequality doesn't matter as they were dismissing Ar Thomas Piketty's statements and points. Now we know that look, look at the damage we're looking around us. How much of it is from COVID and how much of it is from the lockdown implemented in a way that devastated poor people. Please consider those migrants. They're not running from they're not running from COVID. Their world was shut down. What do they eat? What do they drink? Where do they go? They are telling you if you speak to them, if we are to die, Let's die at home amidst our families. Right. So how much of the damage is actually from the virus? And how much of the damage is from how we have chosen to address it? But your fairness question will come. I mean, I think I've answered that. OK, uh, we have one uh, more uh, very sure. uh, Arvind, go, go ahead, please. Arvind, um, is you, you've been there. Sure. Thank you. Uh, go good afternoon, sir. So uh, one point that I very strongly agree on that you mentioned was that we should learn to shut up and listen sometimes, which is uh, something that has been forgotten by journalists today. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yeah, yeah, I'm listening to you. 
Is Arvind has connection gone bad? Mountain can. I think uh, uh, Devam also had a question. Arvind, uh, go ahead if you if your right. audio is right, fine. Right, right. Uh, so one point that I strongly agree on, which you mentioned, is that we should learn to shut up and listen sometimes. And journalists today have somehow forgotten that entire uh, fact. And uh, I think uh, if TV and media today is not discussing uh, rural India so much, there is also a positive side to it because uh, media today would be doing a massive disservice to the rural side of our country because sensational news is all that sells today. And uh, the distinction that you made between a journalist and a journalist working between a media house is, is very important because the moment you uh, are employed by a media house, you become an employee, you lose control. So how? my question is, how does a... How does an independent journalist get the story out to a large audience on his own capacity by not uh, depending on a media house, by not uh, compromising at all? How is it possible? I just, uh, asking. Yeah. Sainath, I just, Arvind also earlier had asked because he had gone through your site, so you could answer all of it. He said it's very crisply written, short sentences. So who's it's, it's precisely it's, it's precisely like like your lecture. It's precisely you like your lecture today. If you have the time, can you also just tell us how you're doing it? Because yeah. he specifically had that question. The so, first yeah. questions that you asked, Arvind, are really what is the answer to the secret of life? Okay. I mean, I wish I knew the answers to all those questions. The thing is. Uh, but one thing, I don't think there's any immediate or, you know, impending danger of the corporate media covering rural India too much. No, I don't think that's going to happen. And I think, though, it is a good thing if rural media, rural India appears at all in the media. Let me tell you what the numbers are. In Delhi, pretty close by to you guys. There is a the oldest media monitoring organization of India called CMS and Bhaskara Rao's Center for Media Studies. They have been monitoring media for 30 years and they did a very good job of it. These days you don't hear of them. You don't know of them because they are. Because media companies are far more interested in commissioning studies by market research agencies rather than media analysis companies. Okay, but the CMS very obligingly does some figures for me every year and I ask them. They monitor random. They monitor six news channels and six newspapers. In both cases, three Hindi, three English. The amount of space that rural India gets. Okay, on a five year average. The amount of space that rural India gets on the front page of the average national daily. Oh, by the way, I love that word national daily. The definition of national daily is any newspaper that has one edition. Even if it's the only edition coming out of New Delhi. Okay, That's a national daily. The rest of us are anti-national anyway, right? So the. The average front page of the National Daily five year average, the space given to rural India is 0.67%. Now, let me allow me to tell you that the 0.67% is an exaggeration because five year average, one of those five years, as Sabha will realize, is election year, which inflates the average considerably because in election year, that's where the damn votes are. So you're going to cover a lot more over there. So the percentage goes up much more during election time. And that boosts the average for the five year to 0.67. I found that if I remove the election year from the equation, the average space that rural India gets on the front page is between 0.18% and 0.24%. Not my math, I'm, I'm not competent to handle that. That is what the CMS did for me obligingly. The second thing that it showed their data. That 
all the social sector beats put together. And that's why I began by telling you about full time farming correspondence, full time uh, labor correspondence, all the social sector beats put together. That is poverty, hunger, your uh, development beat, your housing beat, your education beat, all the social sector beats put together. Do not get the space that crime and entertainment get. And as you know, in India and in, in Indian media, crime and entertainment seriously overlap. I mean, why do we cover Salman Khan and the Black Bucks? OK. Is it because the Black Bucks died or is it because that's Salman Khan? Right. I mean, there's a very serious overlap over of these two categories there and together they have more space than all your social sector beats. That is appalling. And that's where I spoke about 75% of the population not being counted as fit to cover. You know, they're not, they're not, they don't matter. They don't count. They're not even digits. So that's where you are on the newspaper front. Second, how do you make yourself heard? Oh boy. One thing I want you to know, Arvind, since you are a student and you're going out there to work tomorrow, horrible though it may sound, I want you to work in at least for a while in that mainstream corporate media. I want you to work there because A, you need to know that world from within. You need to know, you need the discipline that still exists of being put as a reporter on a beat accountable to someone. That this maybe a year, maybe two years, maybe three years. Being a freelancer directly without the experience of having worked in a media organization, it's possible, but it's very difficult. I think you need the collegiality. I think you need people constantly telling you where you went wrong, your colleagues telling you that, hey, why didn't you ask this question? Why didn't you get into this? I have, I have found that invaluable. Totally. So I'd like you to work there for a while. Yeah. How do you make your voice heard? You keep yelling. You know what was it? Gunther Grass or Herman Hesse who said the job. The job of a good citizen in society in a democracy is to never shut up. That's the opposite <laughs> of what I told you. But that is the. To do the talking, you first need to do the listening. And the other point that I'd like to make to all of you is you want to be great reporters. You want to be great writers. I believe there has never been a great writer. Who was not also a great reader. Read. You know, and read with skepticism. I keep a notice on, on my notice board. I keep three or four of my favorite sayings. OK. One is about editors and one is about reading. The, my favorite saying on reading comes from Miguel Cervantes. You remember Don Quixote? I hope you guys studied that in or read it in school or college. Cervantes said of his own character, Quixote, reading everything he may, reading everything he came across made Don Quixote a great man. Believing everything he read made him mad. Yeah, I think this country is pretty much in that situation. There are people who read everything that comes from the trolls and believe everything that is told to them by the trolls. Right. Believing everything he read. So you read massively. It made him a great man. You read with skepticism, analyze, understand that. That's one rule. The other thing you need to know about publishing, getting your voice heard. My favorite saying is from Mark Twain. Who wrote in 1896. Yours was not in the beginning. A criminal nature. Yours was not in the beginning. A criminal nature. At age nine, you stole sugar. At 15, you stole horses. At 19, you committed arson. 
And at 25, you stole money and robbed banks. At 30, hardened by crime, you became an editor. <laughs> okay, so that's who I don't think much has changed in the century and 20, 26 years since 24 years since then. Okay, he had a very good perception of who editors and publishers were. So learn that. But I also found that working in a mainstream organization, I worked in the United News of India, in a news agency, in a weekly, in a daily. There's an incredible amount to be learned. And the discipline of that, then you become a freelancer, you're more equipped. Now, the problem with being heard, you know, after all the romancing of the Internet and social media, we are finding out who gets to be heard, right? Here's the problem with the Internet. The Internet guarantees you a voice. It doesn't guarantee that anyone is going to listen to it. You'll have a voice. It doesn't get now. You've just got to keep at it. Huh? And there is very, very good precedence for you in the history of Indian journalism. Small publications, small journals have had enormous impact in this country's history. Do you know that Gandhi's great newspapers, which set the moral tone for all debates in this country for 30 years? What was the print order of Young India or Harijan or Indian Opinion? 5,000, 3,000, 6,000. But the quality of the discussion, the moral authority of what was raised, compelled the rest of the media to discuss and debate it. So the imperialist newspapers, which was, by the way, the Times of India and Statesman and others, had to, to rebut a Gandhi to rebut a Bhagat Singh, to rebut the other great journalists of our time, to rebut an Ambedkar, they had to cover them, take their arguments on board and reply to them. How many of you know, you see all of us, I was very disappointed and a bit heartbroken when I toured Punjab last year or a year before last and found that even in Punjab, all of us know Bhagat Singh as a martyr, as a revolutionary, as a political activist, he was all of these. Do you know what Bhagat Singh was professionally? He was a journalist and he was a freelance journalist. He earned his living from journalism, for God's sake. Look at what you can do, hmm? what a guy like that could do, Arvind. Bhagat Singh wrote in dozens of journals, but four main journals. And he wrote in four languages and was learning a fifth and sixth. OK, he, he, he learned when underground, he learned Bengali and wrote a piece or two in Bengali. But you know that our beloved bogs can never accept anyone that anyone else can ever speak or write Bengali. Right. So I think he gave up on that. <laughs> he was Sabah, he was learning Persian. Hmm. He he in, it was in the Punjab. Uh, and in uh, India of between 1800 and 1910, 1920, Persian was a major language. Yeah. Uh, Raja Ram Mohan Roy, his first paper was not in Bengali. It was in Persian, Miratul Akbar. Okay? That was Raja Ram Mohan Roy's publication. Bhagat Singh wrote in Hindi, in English, in Urdu and in Punjabi. Okay, His first pieces came in the Akali magazine. Then he in uh, Kirti, where he did most of his political writing, he wrote in Hindi. He wrote in Urdu. It was very common in Punjab. My father-in-law, I'm married to a Punjabi. My father-in-law was in the army. I think his Urdu was as good or better than his Punjabi. And uh, I mean, he's a Sikh, was a Sikh. Um, so Bhagat Singh wrote in uh, in Veer Arjun, in Partab, the Hindi newspaper, that's not the Partab of today, but the one that died in the yeah. 50s. Veer Arjun, Partab, Kirti, Akali, four languages he wrote, a fifth he was training at, and all this are with by the age 23. 23. 
Okay. How old are you, Arvind? I'm 21, sir. Yeah, you got two years to see if you can catch up on that. So see what the possibilities are. This guy was a journalist. I I resent it terribly that we don't recognize Bhagat Singh, the journalist. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, there have been others who have been putting his work together in English. So please look at the journalistic work. <clears throat> Yeah, that uh, that paper Pratap is actually a matter of a special study, uh, Kishroy. I, you know, one could take it up at the journalism school. It's a very fascinating history of that paper. Anyway, I, Devam, uh, another student has a question. Devam, yeah. please come up. Uh, please go ahead. Hello, sir. My name is uh, My question to you is about the paid news is a democracy. What you wrote in Hindu in 2000. After six years, you told that um, all the TV channels are bought by religious industries. Actually, is bought by them. So, so, I just wanted to know, so do you, are you trying to say that paid news is almost fake news or vice versa? Uh, no, you see, the thing is, you know, this whole fake news debate, I have a lot of mixed feelings about it. It suggests that there was no fakery earlier. You know? Oh, that it's it's very virtuous for us to act as if this is something that's come up in the last year or two. What has happened in the last few years? Its scope has exploded. It's become huge. Hmm. But when it was done by regular institutions with the bourgeois respectability, when the New York Times carried fake stories on weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, which led to a war the whole world is paying for now. We didn't call it fake news. The reporter Judith Miller, who did those stories, was encouraged by her editors to do so. And five years later had to quit the Times on some other matter, not on this. The fact that she faked stories, that Saddam Hussein had a chemical weapons uh, establishment bigger than two football fields underground in Baghdad. These fake stories were done by the New York Times, the Washington Post. We didn't call them fake news. We didn't call them fake news. They were totally fraudulent and fake. What today we call fake news is, you know, uh, your terrorist is my freedom fighter. Right? So, uh, Look, look at the people who are being arrested under this COVID crisis. People who are doing actually a public service, like the editor of that portal, Simplicity in, in Tamil Nadu, who's been arrested for saying, for fake news and spreading disaffection, because he has been reporting stories that doctors and medical personnel and junior medical personnel are receiving no supporting protective equipment, no proper care. He's in, he's in jail. He's arrested. You had Vineet in, uh, in Varanasi from the prime minister's cons uh, constituency being having an FIR filed, filed against him for showing that Musahar children in the prime minister's constituency were eating grass in hunger. That was also followed up on and reported by many others. OK, you have that. So officially, these guys are fake news. But the people who carried morphed and absolutely fraudulent videos of Kanhaya Kumar during the JNU troubles, yeah, during the, the Azadi tapes, right? Nothing of, they, they are absolutely the most respected anchors at the government level. They are the people, the only people the government speaks to, the prime minister will speak to. So this thing of your fake news is my exclusive, you know, this is going to go on forever. Paid news was an industry. OK, paid news happened because um, see the journalistic individual journalistic corruption. That's as old as journalism. But paid news was not an individual journalist corruption. It was the industry making money out of it. What happened? 
between around the early 2000s, many of our newspapers, which were very profitable and had huge assets, like the entire Bahadur Shah Zafar Marg in Delhi, is full of buildings on land given free or at throwaway rates to newspapers because we had a prime minister called Jawaharlal Nehru who actually believed in freedom of the press. OK, and he wanted to give these guys something press running a press was not profitable in in uh, in British India. It was not profitable. You lost you lost your life sometimes, let alone your money. So. He tried helping them. And they put up all these huge buildings and ran all their presses from one floor and the remaining 24 floors gave out for rents to various companies and corporations to make rental money. Now they were. These are incredibly important properties. Nariman Point, Bahadur Shah Zafar Mark. In my time in Delhi, also known as Bahadur Shah Dafar Mark. Yeah, but uh, um, all these properties were tangible properties. In the late 90s and 2000, with the liberalization, many of our media firms started getting into intangible properties. They went on to the stock market. The pay the, the private treaties. Many of these came in the form of shares. By 2008, companies were holding the majority of their wealth. In intangible properties, shares, debentures, whatever, 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 you know. Not my area. Then comes the 2008 collapse in Wall Street which is then reverberating all around the world. Suddenly, the most profitable companies in the country found themselves running in losses. Newspapers that had never seen the red ink found themselves running on losses. And it's no surprise that it's in 2009 that, by the way, hundreds of journalists are laid off just before the election, just before the election. Do you remember? CNN, IBM journalists, 150 of them protesting Sabha outside yeah, CNN, yeah. IBM. Yeah, yeah. Sakal was about 150. They shed these journalists like confetti. Yeah. OK, they're doing it again. Hmm. And then because they had convert, they held all their properties in shares, so much of their money, those shares were not worth the paper they were written on. And Nonetheless, they had to pay taxes on that value. The income tax department doesn't give a damn about your private treaty. It, it says we know that a full page ad in your newspaper costs three crores. You are going you got full page ads. We don't care what your arrangement with pantaloons was. You pay us the tax on three crores. So the papers ran into trouble. That's when they got into paid news. Paid news was an off the books transaction. Paid news did not require accounting. You paid no income tax on it. It was such a convenient thing. They ran a parallel industry called paid news. So paid news was a seriously commercial venture. And fake news is highly political and social. Also what we are looking at, it's a the and you know, I don't believe in a single other country in the world. Yeah, we've got sectarianism. We've got religious fanaticism, fundamentalism, racism in all countries. In America, once the uh, flu started in the Midwest, Chinese looking people were attacked. And the joke, big joke, Kung flu, you know. But I don't believe in any country. The kind of minority baiting. The institutionalization of existing discrimination against minorities that the scale at which fake news that seems to be to be the dominant okay. domain and realm of fake news. The sheer yeah. sheer uh, bashing minority bashing that's going on, the sheer amount of lies and stuff that's going on. That I think is to me what appears to be the, the main venue or theater of fake news. 
the social political. So uh, folks, I mean, we've signed up, we've taken up so much of your time. Students who have any more questions, uh, anyone just speak up now. I, some of you WhatsApp me, so I took your names. So why don't, we take, th why don't we take three questions and then I'll answer. So students, uh, I, have, uh, I have taken the names of those who WhatsApped and asked for the messages. Anyone just come forth now and speak uh, up. Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, my name is Priya. And I just wanted to ask, uh, you mentioned that you need to report on rural problems. You need to be with the person. You need to spend time doing what they do. So uh, my question to you is that after putting in so much um, of yourself into the story, and after witnessing firsthand their sufferings, how, how do we uh, keep our personal biases and personal emotions out of the story when we report it? OK, one, you want a second question? That's Priya. Come on, next, just ask. Sina. I think uh, Mr. Sainak is taking out, taking down, and he'll answer them together. Yeah. Because we have less time. Come up. Many of you wanted to. Yeah, hello, I'm, sir. I'm OK for a few minutes run over. Go on, Sabah. Yeah. Um, hello, sir. My name is Khushi. And uh, I wanted to ask that uh, you said uh, that there is an attempt to impose a single language, right, in media organizations. So when we report, we do it in a different language. And when we write, it's it's mostly in English. So how do we manage that balance when we convert the language? How do we do that? Okay. 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 One more. Come on. Good. Huh? We're all asking nice questions. Even any faculty out here present in the group could ask a question. So anyone? I mean, a lot of faculty is attending. Hi. OK, so shall we? Can I add a question, Sainath, if you have yeah. time? I just want yeah. to know the yeah. question about uh, the Pari thing. If you can just explain us, because that's how do you keep it? Uh, I mean, are you editing all the stories yourself? Do you have editors? There is such. Uh, how are you keeping it going? And uh, you know, I mean, and also the question. There's one question we are talking about covering. Is it does the idea of how are you get? Who are the people who are reporting from the interiors for you? Are they people who live there? Are they reporters who have traveled from Bombay or wherever they are or another town and gone there? Can you just? Just the logistical yep. answers. I want to know how you do okay. it. So okay, just... I'll, I'll come to the Pari thing last. Okay, let me start with Pari inside. Well, and it answers part of uh, Kushi's question also. Kushi, we are publishing in 12 to 13 languages. If you visit Pari and click on that button saying English, English is the default. If you click on it, you can read the same, you can read the same uh, story. The latest stories will not appear immediately in 12 languages because translation takes time. Who are the translators and how do we ensure quality? Our translators, some of them are volunteers, some of them are people who do. We give a small honorarium, not very serious. However, many of them are university professors, lecturers, teachers of those languages. OK, uh, and that now, for instance, one of them is a newspaper person who's a PhD in Urdu and in history and whatnot, and he translates both into Urdu and Hindi for us. Kamar Tabres. OK, a, a very veteran journalist and editor as well. Um, then. What we do is after a translation is done into language, into Urdu, Hindi, Malayalam, whatever it is. We get a reviewer for each and every piece in each and every language. We get a reviewer who is someone other than the translator to see that the translation is up to a quality. So sometimes we have three, four translators in a language sometimes and they review each other's work. So we keep a quality control over it. You know that that is a 
And I, as, as I said, we are fortunate in that a hell of a lot of people who are university level teachers, professors are doing translations for us. Why do they do it for us? It's a very important quality in journalism. Forgotten, drummed out into your drummed out of your heads in two years after there, it's called idealism. People do things out of idealism. People join journalism out of idealism. You know, everybody doesn't do everything just for money. Money helps and it's very important. It's very important if someone's got to eat, someone's got to pay their bills. Yeah, we do that. But some of them are so senior in their professions, they don't need money from us. They're better off than us in some cases. So that's one thing on the language. Second, um, about Pari being so crisp, a hell of a lot of work takes place at the desk. There are several editors, I mean, but three mainly. The person who is actually doing, giving you that, the laying down the law and the rules and everything else, that is a journalist of 30 odd years experience by the name Sharmila Joshi. Sharmila Joshi does that quality which you are seeing to it. OK, maybe the crispness or short sentences. That is my imposition, I suppose. Uh, yeah, I knew it. Yeah. I knew it, Sainan. <laughs> yeah. that, that, that comes from my journalism and comes from what I've done. But there are there is Sharmila Joshi. There is Vinuta Malia. We have Sharmila set up the structure, the guidelines. If you go on to the Pari website and look at our guidelines, contributor guidelines, you'll see the kind of demands we make of a journalist. Second, when the journalist actually goes to the field, we give them a cheat sheet. So many boxes that you need to mentally tick off. Little, little things. Please don't come back and write in your story someone's name as Hanglu. Please have the respect for the person to inquire what his or her full name is. You and I would be pissed off if we were referred to by our nicknames in the media. OK, you want to show respect to your subject. There are a number of rules we give in our cheat sheet. That cheat sheet, we we amend and change the sheet according to the subject being covered. So if we are covering climate change, we have a cheat sheet for reporters on climate change. Third, uh, normally every single story, well, all our stories, all Pari stories are field stories. There is one change that has come with COVID. Okay. Yeah, our reporters, our volunteers are spread out in incredibly different parts of the country, and we're all the time getting new young people wanting to write for Pari. We don't have the resources to take on all of them as we would like to. But many of them I would love to take on. I don't have the money or the resources to do that. But uh, right, we all all party stories are mandatory field stories. What's happened under COVID one? We have reporters who are where they are. We have Purushottam Thakur who works actually in the Azim Premji Foundation school sector in Chhattisgarh. Purushottam Thakur is a, one of the most aggressive and wonderful reporters of Odisha who can't find a space in the Odia media because he is incorruptible. Okay. The fool goes around, gets a job, does stories which implicate the owners of his newspaper or channel in the story. Okay. So you don't keep jobs long if you do that, right? But he is that kind of a reporter. He's an incorruptible reporter. So he's working as an uh, working as an activist of the foundation of a foundation there in Damtari in Chhattisgarh. Now he is a fantastic reporter, but his languages are Hindi and Odia. He writes in English, but we are going to have to work on that to some extent. That's where the strong desk comes in. Second, uh, but he's the fantastic reporter. The reporting is his. Then second, there are 
so under COVID, we have Purushottam where he is. We have Jaydeep Hardikar where he is in Vidarbha, in the heart of Vidarbha. We have reporters in very unusual, very unusual places. Second round, then there's a second issue. We have reporters who got stuck while in the field or while they've gone out and the lockdown came. So we have Medha Kale, who is from Pune, stuck in Tuljapur. So she does stories from there on the Tuljapur famous Bhavani temple, the Tuljapur temple economy and how it's been wrecked. On there are 5000 pujaris dependent on that temple. OK, so if that imagine the general population. So what's happened from there? So there are reporters of us who have gone out somewhere and are stuck under the lockdown in unusual places doing that. Then there are several volunteers and reporters of ours who are going around with food distribution teams as volunteers. Sweta Daga in uh, Bengaluru. So they're going there and doing stories while on the circuit. There are volunteers of ours like Purushottam who won't stop running about. I mean, even if I tell them, OK, you're not to move about, Jyoti Shinoli, our reporter in Mumbai, uh, Purushottam Thakur, they are going out. They're taking precautions. They are going out. They're meeting people. They're talking to people on the highway. Purushottam is visiting villages of the particularly vulnerable tribal groups like the Kamars in Odisha and in Chhattisgarh. We have Jaydeep who went on to and even brought back six migrants to a shelter in Nagpur only to find that they got sick of the shelter and walked away home over the next four days anyway to Madhya Pradesh. But our reporters are interacting with people. OK, so this that's then we have fourth, the fourth system. Look, unlike the rest of the media. We cover migrant laborers 365 days a year. We are on first name basis with hundreds of them. We know them by name. We can call them on phone. We have photos of them already. We have photos of the brick kilns and we know people who are working in the brick kilns. We have photos of the cement factory in Kutch. We know people who are working there. We can call them on phone. We can call people on phone, but here's a problem. Many of those people on the highways, their phone batteries have died. OK, and there is no place to recharge those batteries. Nonetheless, I mean, I have been calling people I know. Nonetheless, a huge group of volunteers is able to phone and get comments on what's happening. And some of those people are savvy enough. It's always been our mandate that we try getting the journalism out of those communities. So do you know that there are little guys in the in the Gaulis of uh, Nagpur milk producers who are shooting little videos on their phone and sending it to us. So it's actually coming also from the field. There are slum dwellers in Bangalore who will shoot videos for us and send it. We have got videos from people who are migrant laborers. We've got videos from people who are construction laborers walking away home. So there are many ways in which Pari is adapting to the situation that is there. Outside of that situation, we never carry, if you look, Pari has no opinion pages. We carry every story is a field story, and it also has no opinion pages simply because we think it's a particular journalistic vanity to pretend that there is no opinion in your writing. OK, all writing has a bias. You know, there's a question of whether it is a good bias or a bad bias. Now, if I ask all you students, are you for child labor or against child labor? What would you say? Against child labor. Well, you're biased. You have a bias against child labor. That doesn't stop you from writing about child labor, does it? It's a good bias. But what you then do is exercise discipline. The bias should be limited to your choice of the subject. Bias you are choosing. Why did I become a sports journalist and not a business journalist? Because I'm biased in favor of sports. I love cricket. By the way, I am a cricket fanatic. OK, um, that's a bias, isn't it? I think the word you're searching for 
there's a very big difference between bias and prejudice. Okay. Okay. So, all Christians and Muslims are really foreigners. That's not a bias. That's a goddamn prejudice. It's an evil, venomous prejudice. That is something you want out altogether. Bias is something, you know, I, I have a, all of us are biased against corruption, right? So when you cover governments, see, generally, if you are covering corruption, you can be as biased as reality often is. Yeah, sometimes the facts are biased. Make a distinction between bias and prejudice, but rest, refrain, restrict your bias to the choice of your subject, the choice of your domain. When you are doing the story on child labor, there you bring in the discipline that you learned as a reporter. Okay, now this also bias does it doesn't mean, you know, one of the things that we have to do away with for 30 years, I've been shouting about it. This concept of fake, what I call fake balance in the media. Fake balance on our uh, panel discussion is spokesman of Congress, spokesperson of BJP. So I'm unbiased and giving you up. Now, don't try balancing truth and rubbish. OK, now uh, if. If. If Saba says the world is spherical, the, the world is round in shape. And Kishlai says, no, it's a triangle. And I say, no, it's a rectangle. So we have to arrive at some via media that it's maybe oblong or something like that because the truth lies between opposing biases. You know, I had this debate many years ago. I, he, had the, he had the spirit and the humor to take it properly. Veteran editor, Mr. M. V. Kamath, debating me on bias and prejudice in Bombay and saying that the truth lies between extreme biases in the middle. So I said, look, it means if I take your left hand and place it on fire and your right hand and place it on bias in ice, your body temperature should be about normal, right? Because the truth and normalcy lies between opposing biases. It doesn't. The truth can be very one sided and it can be multi sided. It's not just two versions of a story. Sometimes there can be five versions of a story. Your job as a journalist is to work out the to make a judgment. Yes, journalism, you often make judgments on the weightage of each. Now, for instance, if I'm doing a story on the bonded labor of the brick kiln or the child laborer, do I give equal weightage to what the child is saying and what the Malik is saying? If I do that, I am the world's worst journalist. If I treat, if I give equal space and equal importance to the to the landlord of the bonded laborer and his version, carry it. I must carry his version. In fact, I think his version makes the story much richer. But I don't pretend that it has equal credibility as what the victim is saying. I, some of the greatest stories that my favorite stories that I have done, they've been made by the wicked landlord because he produces copy. OK. Hmm. The greatest Landlord of old Bihar, Jagdishwar Jit Singh, Ma Manatu Mawar. Man, what copy he made for me. He was the most hideous guy, but he he knew the bluff of journalism. He knew what bluffers we are. And when I was photographing him, he told me. Bhai sahab, aap ye left side, se, left side se amara photo mat lena. Photograph me from the right side. I look more evil on the right side and your editor wants an evil looking picture of me. <laughs> okay. Then, then I then I said, you know, is it true that you had a tiger and your tiger, uh, you know, you, that you had a tiger and you terrorized your uh, uh, constituents and your people in these villages? He said, Janab, I I was a small I 
आई हैड अ स्मॉल चीटा आप जैसे पत्रकार लोग उस चीता को लेके उसको डबल प्रमोशन देके बाग बना दिया ही मेड द कॉपी ओके आई हैड टू टॉक बट इफ आई प्रिटेंडेड दैट ही वाज एज ट्रूथफुल और एज डिसेंट एंड एज क्रेडिबल एज द विक्टिम्स ऑफ मनाटू हु आई स्पोक टू देन आई थिंक दैट इज इन जर्नलिज्म एट ऑल आई थिंक दैट्स फेक न्यूज़ I think that's false report. I give his version. You must have his version. Yeah, but this fake balance, forget it. You know, you make judgments about weightage. There are issues on which we know nothing, and if there are two expert versions on it, you give both. That's some stories are like that. I mean, I know nothing about nuclear physics. Okay, if I'm in a position where I'm compelled to do a story on that, I will want. someone to advise me on it the uh, in pari stories we are focused on what are ordinary people experiencing a particular situation saying we try we do talk to experts we do we bring in experts we value experts but we never allow the expert to overwhelm the story the story belongs to that person i'll give you a clear if you get on to pari and look at our climate change series now climate change is such a subject where you need experts you need people to tell you what's going on like covid 19 is such a subject but what happens when the media reports purely through experts and reports is that you end up having readers and viewers think climate change is something happening in the bush fires of new south wales in the deforestation in amazon and the melting of the antarctic ice sheet it's not something happening in my home and in my garden right by telling climate change by reporting climate change through the lives of ordinary people you bring it much closer to the reader and viewer you know what our experience was we got the experts some of the finest we got the ordinary people we foregrounded the opinions of ordinary people and rounded off the story with the expert opinion and we found 20 times out of 20 times the experts through their research were coming to the same conclusions that ordinary people were coming to through their lived experience because a good expert and a good researcher will research that right so there was a great ground of commonality between that but the fact is that the ordinary people made much better copy their stories of how they came to, what happened in their food crop what happened why they shifted crop what what is destroying the crop of marathwada year after year in climate change it gives people a much better sense of it how do we run pari how oh, i wish to hell i knew right it is running on idealism okay now uh, we don't take direct grants from government not that any government is about or anxious to give me any but we don't we don't take direct grants from corporations because that is that by the way is my bias and prejudice we'll work with anyone someone commissions us to do something we'll do like if i'm a freelance journalist huh, a newspaper i may intensely dislike my ask me to do a story and i might do it okay i will do it on my terms that's that's our role however we haven't had much experience of that we we are running we have five six sources of funding the first is free volunteer labor pari as a website there's about 2.5 crores worth of free techie labor done by 60 to 70 techies from mainly from a group called thoughtworks on their free time for which we were not billed and all these techies the a were in the age group 23 to 28 you know something guys idealism still lives 23 to 28 many of them admittedly were my readers when i was in the hindu okay well 
Many of them, as you can guess, then are from Chennai and Bangalore, where you have the readers of the Hindu in large numbers. When I said I'm going to start something like this, they volunteered their labor. I went and asked at an annual general meeting of that company. And they had a very they had a chief executive and owner, very eccentric guy who said anyone wants to do it. We want Bill. You can volunteer your time. They did. 200 hands went up. Okay. But 60, 70 of them worked on this site. Second source. So you can imagine how many crores of rupees we would have had to spend if we had had to. And then we'd have had to hire managers and executives to implement all that, right? We didn't do a damn thing like that. The kids did it themselves. They set it up for us on the basis of us telling them what journalistically we wanted to see. The second source was the trustees, what we earn, we put into it. None of us is independently wealthy, but let's say I go and teach one semester at Princeton or you know, which I've done two semesters there. And let me say honestly and upfront, why do I, I do it for the money? OK, I like teaching in India more, but I do it for the money. That money goes into pie. Uh, our uh, fellow trustee Namita Viker, managing editor of this of Pari, she does her. Uh, uh, she has a small solutions IT company of her own, but she is spending all her money on the on Pari as well. A lot of her money. Several of uh, several of us are also highly skilled professionals like Sharmila Joshi in journalism working, preferring to work for Pari. At one third of their mark, what they would command on the market as a salary. Much less than the, what they would get in the market because here they get to do what they're comfortable with doing. And as I said, that quality control, that editorial thing that impressed you people. A lot of credit would go to her and then some of it to the rest of us who also put it together. And now we have a new person, Vinuta Malia, formerly with Mumbai, with Pune Mira. So the, there are editors and then there are some volunteer editors overseas elsewhere. Once in a while they edit copy for us. Um, our, my rule always is here's the editing. Here's the revelation of the editing secret of everybody loves a good drought and all the other writing I do. I submit it before I put out a piece. I have the youngest people I can find as guinea pigs to read that copy. If they understand it, I send it in. If they don't understand it, I change everything that they didn't understand. There are two journalists, both of whom I think Sabah knows, who were 2021 when I wrote Everybody Loves a Good Drought. Their names are Priyanka Kakodkar and Dion Bansha. You know both of them, don't you? Priyanka. Yeah, I know, I know Priyanka, and you also gave it to me. Uh, I mean, I was yeah. a little over yeah. 20. You gave it to me also, yeah. Yeah. and I loved it, and I was just like fascinated. I thought I met the, you know. What, yeah. what Priyanka and Dion did, I gave it to them on the mandate. Anything you don't, a word you don't understand, a phrase you don't understand, circle it in red. The manuscript came back bleeding. Oh. Okay. I did try explaining the words to them. I changed it to something they understood. If they could understand it, their peer group would. This is my personal editing system. I like young people to look at what I've written. Absolutely. If they, if they understand it, yeah. So, and I learn from each editing stint that I do. But the bulk of editing in Paris is not done by me. Initially it was, but it's since 2016, it's Sharmila. So these are the things we do. The third source of money, which we hope will become the biggest, is random public donations. Right now accounting for one third of all our money. Random, but we can also count if we count free labor of the techies, then it becomes 50%. <clears throat> but random cash donations is 31% of what we of what we spend each year. Then we have people abroad. 
we can't get money okay we can't we have no fcra but what they do they do volunteer editing <coughs> they they are techies working in microsoft apple elsewhere who do volunteer techie work and they also give us free software pay for expensive software suites subscriptions multiple copies of subscriptions like that they do that five little bit of csr we hope we get more we've got some minuscule minuscule stuff from foundations and that has worked for us it's helped us it's a very tiny amount for them and it's not great amount for us but uh, there are some foundations not the giant ones which i would not approach but which have been exceedingly decent in respecting our independence and never discussing with us we have actually had experiences of one or two great foundations where we turned down the grant very famous people very famous foundation we turned it down because we found that it would require of us obligations we could not fulfill and we felt that it was we were being told what to do and how to do it which we do not be told by anyone and there are also look for me in the random donations it matters a hell of a lot when an 83 year old pensioner in kolkata sends me 200 rupees that's worth lakhs of rupees to me that he feels that this is something what is a government pension someone who's 83 what will be his pension hmm? from another age and era that tiny pension he wants to give us 200 rupees yeah so we and by the way pari has one more source of funding we have one journalism awards worth 20 lakhs in the last 14 months yeah that's how we survive now we are going to take a hit we are going to take a hit because every donor everyone wants to put their money into pm cares fund and things like that we have to convince the public we have to convince all your students who are listening that we play an important role in fighting covid i ask students this is what i want to ask all your students would you buy me if i stop by would you buy me a cup of coffee once a month okay i'm sure you would i have no doubt about that at all so why don't you buy me a cup of coffee online the cost equivalent of one cup of coffee at cafe coffee day plus gst which is about 150 rupees so every now and then buy me a cup coffee and put that 150 rupees into paris donor uh, button you guys will help us keep it afloat we need that okay we need that oh i have very good news for you though 3 days ago we got a letter from the us library of congress saying that they consider pari to be a very important part of historical record in web archives and would like to archive pari so pari is now going to be in the us library of congress in their web archive resources to be available to researchers all over the world okay so things happen yeah and we don't have a corpus in fact we were building a corpus just this year it's all being taken over to expenses because all donors donations are going towards covid as they should and we are also donating money there um the other thing that you asked yeah bilingual um i think kushi asked about this bilingual thing i admire and i deeply envy journalists who are truly bilingual i speak four five languages kushi equally badly so but i i am a communicator and i believe that you don't have to be shakespeare to communicate okay you don't have to be kalidasa to communicate a, com a good communicator is not necessarily a good linguist i communicate and one of the things i love about say bihar and they are so tolerant for for them my bad hindi is on one more boli right so they accept it as such and they communicate with me and i communicate with them i've never had a problem communicating 
you know, if you really want to get through to people, you will. And I work with networks, the local activist, the local doctor, the local teacher. So the Kisan, the farm, f farmers union leader there. I have I get credibility by go, being accompanied by that person. So that that's how we do it. Uh, I believe that the language, Indian languages, and I will request everybody in this, the faculty and everybody else, to please stop using the word vernacular languages. It is an insulting, humiliating term devised to mock your languages by that bastard Thomas Babington Macaulay. Thomas Babington Macaulay was a Latin scholar. And he used, we are all using the word vernacular as an equivalent to regional language. That's what we mean, right? We mean local language when we say it. That's not what he meant. That's not what it meant. The Latin sense, there are about nine meanings to it, nuances. The meaning in which he used the word vernacular, you'll find it in that giant heritage dictionary, you know, that one that takes up half your shelf. It is origin of it is vernaculus. Language of the home born slave. For him, that's what Indians were. He wanted Indians only in blood and Europeans in intellect. And he, he said all the literatures of Asia and China and Africa. You know, are not worth one shelf of English literature. This is Thomas Babington Macaulay. Let's not adopt his language. Let's call it Indian languages. And let's call English a language. It's not something above a language. There is the English language and there are Indian languages. And so many of those are so very rich. So very, one, oh, one great thing is happening with Pari in education. Uh, all of you are welcome to write for Pari, by the way, in the education section. And if you want to write in the main section, you will be subjected to the rigor and the demands that we make in our guidelines and cheat sheet. We send back a person five times. That person has to go back to get that story. We will do that. Hmm. Now, here's the thing. In the I'm finding that because we carry stories in so many languages, it's helping a lot of people improve their languages. So suppose I am good at English week in Hindi. I can read the same piece in Hindi and improve my Hindi because quality control has seen to it that I'm reading simple but good Hindi. I want to learn Urdu. I can learn it through Pari by reading the Urdu, which Kamar Tabrez probably ends up making the my language in my article more poetic than it ever was. But I'm learning Urdu from that. Someone who is an Urdu speaker who wants to improve her English or his English can do the same. So we are there. Third, we are now on the curriculum of several universities and colleges and working with interns in several places. We have an NRI system called non-resident intern. It means your own faculty will handle you in the field where you are and you can write for us, work for us. But you first have to read what's on Pari to see the kind of stories we do, how we do it, how we bring it about. Yeah, I think that's all the questions we've. Thanks, Sainath. Uh, in okay. fact, uh, you know, glad you mentioned about the cup of coffee because three years ago when our first journalism batch came in, I told them that uh, uh, the, we have a famous food court uh, where they spend a lot of money. So I told them that, you know, weekly once, if they can sacrifice a pizza, a slice of a pizza and instead buy a book. And I suffer from a delusion that in the last three years, uh, my students have actually built up a large library of 5,000 books. <laughs> but that's a delusion. Uh, so I hope uh, students, you can actually, since you did not live up to the buying books, uh, sacrificing a pizza at least, uh, given to buying a cup of coffee for Sainath. And remember, 
something that I tell you in class that you know if society's problems are not identified, they will not be solved. Journalists identify society's problems, and if you are in this calling, if the way you can contribute right now to be able to, or other journalists to identify is to be able to pay for journalism. You know, journalism cannot come free. I mean, imagine a 28-page newspaper coming to your doorstep for five rupees. I mean, if that was actually, it's it's it's, a, it's an incredible thing uh, that happens. Now you are getting. news free of cost the moment on a click of a button it doesn't come free there are people on the ground working they have their bills to pay they have their needs and you know this is a small way that you can actually keep journalism alive and going but thank you very much sainath uh, i we will let you go but uh, we want to keep the association alive uh, i'm going to encourage students to write to you and let them see where you know how, how they can put in the rigor uh, to be able to get published there or to be at least associated uh, in whatever way uh, saba thank you so much as well to be able to uh, have a class like this i think it's a great way to and also this is our first graduating batch sign up and this is the okay. class for the first graduating batch so uh, best wishes to you students uh, and thanks to everyone